you know, of all the bands that have been discussed on this podcast in its six years, now we're going on seven. I don't think Blue Oyster Cult has ever been mentioned once. Oh, I have yeah. no recollection of it. And they're one of my favorite bands. I know you're a fan. Oh, huge fan. <laughs> and, <laughs> it's an understatement to say I'm a fan. I love BOC. I need to talk about Blue Oyster Cult be- before this whole podcast ends. Um, I'm a fan of yours. So it's like, this is like oh, perfect. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I think I discovered you through Mike Nirenberg. Years ago, you had done, um, I think I think it was um, Dangerous Minds. You had done a review of back issues. Oh, you, yes. You, Michael's the, wonderful. The, the movie, the Hustler movie. Yes. Um, he had sent it to me. This was like right when the film came out. Mm-hmm. So we're talking about seven, at least seven years ago. Oh, my and, God. And... Um, Mike and I go back about 20 years, like over 20 years, actually. So I've always kind of supported whatever work he's done. And, um, you know, anything he's got coming out, I try to get behind it in whatever way I can. And um, oh, yeah. whatever his current project is, you know, he's, he's got a much bigger reach than I do. But whatever way I could, I, you know, I, he's he's done this a few times with me. And you and... You and I have had a few brief exchanges on Twitter over the last few years and brief, but each of them left like an impression on me. I think back to, we had a very brief exchange on Judas Priest a year or two ago. And I don't remember if if you wrote an article or if it was just some post of yours, but my whole life, since I was like 12 or 13, I always tried to figure out what the hell it was that I loved about Desert Plains. And you wrote like two sent two or three sentences on Desert Plains. And I was like, fuck. Like, I've been trying <laughs> to say that for 30 years. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I think I told you that. I don't remember what the exchange was, but. Oh, God, I remember that post now. Yes, that was the post. So I do. I do. Eventually you nailed get, it. <laughs> I need like, to do an article on Priest because, oh, my God, I love, love Priest. And Desert Plains, like the fact that you, that speaks to me so much because that song is one of my favorites. And just that, I think we were kind of talking about how just Point of Entry as an album doesn't. I feel like sometimes I'll hear fans kind of almost sort of bag on it. And I'm like, that's a great album. Like, I don't know why you would bag on that album. Yeah, I've always tried to figure it out. I think what it was is like it, it it's kind of like sandwiched between British Steel and Screaming for Vengeance, which are two much heavier records. Yeah. And um and they just kind of like really broke big with British Steel, I guess, in the US. And you had things like you had things like Rapid Fire on there and Grinder and uh Rage and Steeler and all these, and then they go it, I I think because the emphasis was on melody mm-hmm. and and not so much commercial because it really isn't a commercial record, but it's just everything is kind of like you can sing it. it. It has like a very memorable, catchy melody, things like Turning Circles and mm-hmm. um, uh, Solar Angels and uh, whatever else is on there, Hot Rockin' and... Uh, it's just heading out to the highway. It's a very catchy record, so it doesn't get enough enough love. Desert Plains is one of my favorite songs. Oh, anyway, Rock Under Fire. I have the good fortune and the absolute honor to be joined by a brilliant writer and visionary, Heather Drain, as your um, page says, writer yes. and curator of cultural esoterica, cinema, and music. And while I would love to talk film with you, um, we're going to focus on music tonight. So thank you for doing this. Oh, my gosh. No, thank you. It's it's my pleasure. And um, just the fact that before the intro even began, we were like getting to talk about Desert Plain. And Judas Priest showing that a heavy metal band can do a love song and not be um, just sounding like the most M.O.R., girl i love you you know like everybody knows motley cruz without you and all those awful sort of power ballads not all I of them guess are you're awful, right though you're but- right holy shit i never thought of it that way i'm just like coming to this right now like it is a love song yes that's what so- it like at its at, at its core it's a love song yeah it, it doesn't it doesn't come off like that you no, know it's, it always it's 
it's heavy. It's still heavy. It's like it's got heavy. that priest touch and it and Rob's vocals and the, but there and are still, some nice little minor chords in there. It's like beautiful. And it's got like it's even even got a little bit of like sort of like sort of sensuousness because that whole line about the engine roars between my thighs and then you've got but then it's like you know to bring you love and the whole image of desert plains and a motorcycle and it's rob halford the metal god himself um just yeah it's so it's so epic i mean there's it's, a reason why there's something in you. your descriptions though like your 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 choice of words the, the not the energy that you put into it but yeah there's always an energy but it reminds me of the, the type it, it's like it's like me trying to describe something it's like you just pulled those fucking words out and <laughs> and i'll give you an example like i want to read something to you okay you might recognize it i think you'll recognize it <laughs> But this is what I'm talking about, man. Like, like okay, let me find it because I put it here somewhere. All right. I don't know the I'm not I don't know the artist, but I was reading it and it and it's just jumped out at me because this is this is the type of the language of this is is it's like you're connected to the source. You know what I mean? You're right there. Oh. Um, patriarchy fuses the darkest of metal and electronica to create a nightmarish pastiche and pinpoint iris of a world filled with observers and creators, victims and predators, all the while blurring the lines between the supernatural and the all too real hellscape of our own culture and humanity. This is the kind of poetry and sound born of love gone rot, but not in the simplistic way of romantic relationships starting, stopping and gasping, but the bigger ideal love. That view of a real life existence operating in a well-mentioned bubble fed by bread and circuses because the bigger picture can be as scary as it is overwhelming. Life is beautiful and sweet, but it is equally bloody and ugly. Thus, we are all not only living in the ultimate duality, but in fact, we are the ultimate duality. I could go on, <laughs> but... Um, Oh, and this is, uh, you know, possessing a beating heart and a soul only means your touch is as capable of pleasure and comfort as it is harm and damage. Comforting? No. But this is why we need artists like actually to help cope and process the exquisite fucked upness of it all. <laughs> we were separated at birth. <laughs> oh man it's so cool like to I, I love the way you read that i was like man if, if anybody ever needs me to like they ever want audio books of anything i'm just gonna hire you mike i'm not gonna do it i'm just gonna <laughs> be like i need i need mike to do it <laughs> oh you know what i'm really before we get into that like let me let me let me um another another thing that you kind of inadvertently turned me on to was the first the first bill ward solo album oh and now i don't remember if you could tell me where i found this i don't remember where i read it i don't know if it was mondo heather or if it was some archive of yours that you had online somewhere but i had no idea this album existed but it was something you wrote about right it, it was, was correct yes. if i'm wrong Yes, it was it was on my original blog before I started my my proper website. Right. And um and I need to put it on my website because I don't think I put it on the new website. I couldn't when I find it a second again. time. I was looking for it and I, I was like, where did I and I saw this over a year ago? This is a while back. Yeah, no, I need to put that on the the new because I then I revamped my website and I need to put it on the revamped one, yeah. uh, which it which is mondoheather.com. Plug, plug, plug. But uh no, yeah, we're gonna that, plug you throughout this. Oh, um, thank yeah. you. You already have like, like you seriously might have to be like my second manager or something. That's a <laughs> I can't manage myself. I'm gonna help you. But um, no, that means a lot to me though, because that Bill Ward album um, is I love it. yeah, along the way is so good, and he I just think gets so like overshadowed by the rest of Sabbath, and and I love Sabbath. I mean, I think Black Sabbath are one of the greatest bands ever, but. Bill Ward is such a mighty force and that man could sing like anybody that's listened to Sabbath and you know, it's all right. Um, oh, like that voice. I was and shocked. He, I had no idea. I had no idea. He sang. I had no idea. He did solo albums. I had no idea that it sounded nothing like Sabbath. 
it was like such a nice, pleasant shock to the system. You know, I'm not, I have to admit, I'm not the biggest Sabbath fan. I like Sabbath. I don't love Sabbath, but that was, I was like, holy shit. Oh, it's, it's good stuff. It's so, it's so good. And um, Bill Ward, just like every interview I've ever seen, the man just on top of being just this crazy talent, just seems like a really like sweet, sweet soul. And especially because like delving into that album, I realized so much of it's about him processing addiction and recovery too, but it's not done in such a blatantly on the nose kind of obvious way. It's done in this really just sort of spiritually and emotionally intelligent way um and some of the songs are heavy and fast-paced some of them are so um gentle so some are almost like world music like it's a really good div like musically diverse album and i have um, no memory of ozzy being on that I, I don't remember like was that even to, to to your memory do you was that a single the one that ozzy did was there a video for it? I think I went and I, I remember researching this. Like like I said, it was well over a year ago. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. don't remember. I think there might have been a video for it, though. There, uh, Yeah, there was a, a video for Bombers. Uh, Bombers, that's right. Yeah. And but Ozzy's actually on another song on that album called Jack's Lands, which is also a really great song. Um, yeah. this, the sad thing is, from my understanding, the reason why that album is still very much out of print is at this point is because of the management. Whose name might, might rhyme with Taryn Tosborn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, which um, which is a damn shame because Ozzy's great on those songs and it's a great album. And um what little I've heard off his new album, if we put, if we kind of reminded people how great Ozzy could be, you know, seriously, let the poor man retire. Like, <laughs> we love Ozzy, just let him, let him retire. The man has done his time. But, um, but you know, and this is where I'll segue, what's fascinating is there's some bands though that are in that age, like that age range. Cause Ozzy, I mean, you know, started in the 60s. Um, so few performers can carry on not only making new music, but still bringing that heart and, and great sound just te technically as well as just creatively. And Blue Easter Cult, I mean, they put out a new album um, last year, I believe it was either 2022 or 2021. And the symbol remains and it's great. It's fucking great. Can we cuss on this show? Yes. Oh, thank God. Okay, I think you already <laughs> did, but I always want to yeah. make sure because I, I I tend to curse a lot and I'm so always like, oh, okay, no wonder we are siblings. Oh my God. Yeah. But uh, yeah, <laughs> and I I mean, I got to see them live last year with my, uh, with my husband and they put on a, a hell of a show. And I mean, how unreal is that? As long as the core group of Blue Oyster Cult have been going, they're still uh -huh. bringing it is unreal to me. It's so good. Blue Oyster Cult is, um, I hate to say it, they're one of my favorite bands, but I never, it's one band I have not seen live. I've never. Oh, you need to, live. man. Oh, it is. I had uh, oh. the closest, I, and I had a few chances, but the closest was uh, I had tickets. If I'm not mistaken, I'll bring up Mike again, Nuremberg. We had a bunch of us had tickets to see them and UFO. Oh, whoa. In, in 2004 at a pretty small club in New Jersey, in central Jersey. And um, stupid me blew it off. Like I had no other excuse. I wasn't sick. Nothing came up. I didn't feel like going. It was just yeah. like, you know, I do a lot of like, I don't buy tickets ahead of time for concerts. I'm like, I'll always like, pay you know, a scalper in the parking lot i've always been like like very like for <laughs> the moment if i if I've, t I've i've blown off concerts i'm not you know <laughs> i'm not proud of it because a lot of a few of them were really stupid mistakes that i ended up regretting but whatever whatever happens whatever reason i didn't feel like going out that night and i still have my unused ticket oh wow yeah i have that's to a somewhere yeah <laughs> oh man yeah that um well i will say they still tour so i the your your chance is not uh out out of bounds at this point and they're still 2022 still brought it still uh, and that was with having to sit through the worst opening act i have ever 
<laughs> and I'm not going to say his name because he's more of a regional guy and I to protect the guilty, but that was fucking painful. Like, and I'm, I'm including going to open mic nights. Heather, Heather, you have to conjure up the Lester bangs in you. Oh, and just be honest. I can't. No, I'm not actually, to say, don't tell me who they are. Well, nobody will know who they were because it's some guy that I honestly, I don't even know if I remember his name. I think I blocked it out. You know how like people block out like satanic abuse <laughs> the 80s <laughs> that didn't happen but but you know it's almost like my part of my brain that's like you're good girl like it was bad enough you had to sit through it i mean this is the perfect example at one point he name checked jim dandy from black oak arkansas i felt so bad for jim dandy and jim dandy as a figure is one that kind of scarred me as a child because of a clip i saw with my mother of him oh, man i let's have an episode on him Oh my God. Well, you get somebody else because I I don't want to relive my I trauma. I have a scarring <laughs> childhood memory of that too. I have a scarring childhood memory of that of that guy too. Really? Does it does it involve like his tight pants? No, cause... yours and yours oh. might be yours might be worse than mine. No, mine is just simply um and I was having this conversation with my dad the other day because to this day he has he has no memory of this. But for whatever reason, when when I was a kid, my dad came home from work. And this was in the early 80s. This is 79, 80, mm. 81, the latest. He came home with a paper bag filled with, raced with the, raced with the devil. It's oh, wow. Black Oak, not Black Oak, Arkansas, but in J Jim Dandy later on in the 70s made Black Oak. He dropped Arkansas and it was <laughs> Black Oak. Now they've since reprinted that album. And put Arkansas on the in the cover, oh, right? God. I don't know. Maybe it was a name dispute. I don't know the band that well at all. But yeah, he came home with about a dozen cassettes of Race with the Devil. Oh my God! Why he has no memory of it? <laughs> I was like, "Where did you get this? Why?" He's like, "Somebody at work gave it to me," you know. And um, <laughs> and like me and my brother, it just became like toys for us. We just played with this cassette until one day. I turned it, I put it on and like the, I don't know if you know the song, <laughs> the race with the devil has been covered by Judas Priest. There, there, it was oh. done by a band called Gun in oh, 1968. Yes. I later researched this like years later. Yeah. Because it was like, like so scarring for me as a kid. And the scream at the beginning of race with the devil scared the shit out of me. Like it was just kind of yeah. like, and I was always looking at the cover and this guy on the cover with that like real creepy smile. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's my. That's that's, a, that's actually a really cool traumatic like thing yeah. that um, I will say Girl School also do a really badass cover of that song. The Girl School cover. Them is, too. Yeah. Oh, that was the other so, one I couldn't think of. So good. But um, no, mine is more just like uh vh1 classic was showing a vintage clip of them singing hot and nasty and hearing that gravelly toady voice like you know hot and nasty and he had on these spandex pants you know what religion he was born into because there is no hiding the outline of his like penis and my mother is like hey that's your boyfriend and i'm like Shh gross and like she was like tormented me with this you know um, we got david lee roth out of him right i know that's yeah. that, that's that's the one caveat because i love david know. lee roth but um me too but yeah and in fact actually one of my early child my earliest childhood heroes was diamond, day, was diamond day which would probably explain a lot but um but yeah but no but going back to um how did, how did we even get this is my fault why know. did i even break up like it was something about like, the opening oh, act like something oh, like reminded oh god me of yes jim dandy. yes no because no he mentioned the opening act mentioned name chat jim dandy who i guess has a museum or runs a museum in black oak like the town of black oak in arkansas and i've never felt worse for this man and I'm not a big fan of Black Oak, Arkansas um, at all, but oh my God, because this opening act was, oh, uh, and he sang Night Moves, which is literally one of my least favorite classic rock songs ever, like the Bob Seger tune, and yeah. hearing some uh, god-awful Memphis ass baby do that song was terrible. Like, I mean, it made me feel bad for Bob Seger. I don't like being in that moral place, but yeah. it was all worth it to get to boc because they brought it 
down. They killed it. They're always so good about changing up their set list too. They're, you know, it's not like some legacy bands where, you know, you know exactly what you're going to be getting. Like they'll throw in deep cuts that, you know, the hardcore fans are going to be like, oh shit, you know. Um, yeah, and for me, and especially because, I mean, yeah, now it's not the original lineup because, I mean, Alan Lanier passed away a few years ago. So, and um, I know both Bouchard brothers have been out of the band a long time, but you still get Buck Dharma and Eric Bloom, who are two of the foundings. And the other players are great, including Richie Castellano, who, mm. oh my God, that guy ha can sing like an angel and shred like the devil. He is amazing. Like it's, you, you definitely will get your money's worth going to see. Yeah. I haven't paid attention to what, what their schedule is. If they're, if they're doing dates anywhere around here, um, I don't know. It's just, it's just no excuse. I remember them. I remember being on the shore, being on the beach and, uh, and they were playing Asbury Park one summer. Oh, wow. So I think they were playing with Rainbow. Um, oh my God. Who was even in Rainbow at that point? At that point, I want to say Joe Lynn Turner. Oh, okay. That's think, tracks. But I'm, it, it, or it may have been, no, 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 no. I'm mistaken. I think it was, it was like, this was probably Grand Bonnet. Oh shit. Are you serious? Yeah, it was probably Grand oh. Bonnet. Oh my God, my heart. I just yeah. literally, oh, I just. I mean, I he, he wasn't Bonnet. with Rainbow that long. He wasn't, no, he, he only wasn't. stuck around. Oh my God. But that album, like Down to Earth, is so good. And Graham Bonnet is, oh, <laughs> one of the legends for me. I love Graham Bonnet, a criminally underrated vocalist. This is another, like, this is another show I never did. Graham Bonnet. Alcatraz. I love Alcatraz. I oh. love that first, the first two Alcatraz albums. I'm a sucker for. Oh, they're, they're so they're, good. They're like a soft spot. Those MSG records, they just don't make voices like that. No, they don't. Like um, his God, you listen to Jet to Jet, like yeah. when he was with Alcatraz <laughs> and just that vocal, and you know, just so many. Actually, there was funny because that when Eddie Trunk used to have that show, um, that metal show, yeah, they had Graham Bonnet, Bonnet on, and one of the co-hosts was like, "Oh man, that." that big like vocal you know solo you do in uh god's god bless video it's amazing and graham just goes oh that's great because it gave me diarrhea yeah. <laughs> the the steve, the steve Vai. Is you about steve Vai? like no it's not about because it's that you know that you know blah, like that long extended note he when he's singing the yeah. like the chorus and, and it's just funny watching him sing um, it live because he was horrible live he was just like you know he could not hit his own notes so i was like oh why couldn't they not lower lower the keys you know like, even back then he would struggle to sing that stuff live but that was part of like that was one of the reasons i loved it you know i don't know if it's Japan 1984 there was one of the it was an old VHS of Alcatraz that I had and it just wasn't his best night but uh isn't that the worst I, if I was a musician that'd be my fear because everybody I don't care how good you are unless you're like Frank Zappa on that level everybody's gonna have a night that's just yeah. I feel like if I was a musician, that would be my luck. It's like the night, the night they're going to record this for all posterity is the night I'm just going to shit the bed. Yeah. And, and, yeah. But, but like the, the banter in between songs is like, it's like hilarious. It's like, so I don't know. It was almost like he wrote it before. It's like, you can like recite that with the songs. It's like, oh, you know, God. here's a song about some people you have yet to meet. I have yet to meet because they hide from everyone. And it did like going into Karina Corey. Oh my God. Like, okay. You know, like Hiroshima Monomore. like, don't forget Hiroshima. Never. It's like, this is as good as the music. The only other person I could compare that to with the, in the, the between song banter is Paul Stanley. Yes. You know? like I was Paul just. Stanley does I, the same thing, you know? Oh my God. Paul, that, and he, he, it doesn't matter what town. It, yeah because he he'll even tailor it. that's the thing about paul i love it he'll tailor it like i actually uh we saw him when kiss played like rogers the great city of rogers arkansas year um gosh i was like four or five years ago now and he literally did this whole thing of like all right rogers i've been hearing that the people of little rock say you don't know how to rock and like oh but there's no rifle there's no rivalry between these two towns like 
<laughs> and but and it's because my husband Jack has like he's originally from New England and he saw he's seen Kiss live off and on since the Dynasty era. Yeah. <laughs> and so much of it has like not changed that much. Like I know. <laughs> he'll you know it's, he's been it's... saying he's saying the same stuff he was saying <laughs> in like 1975. It's like it's like you you know you want to see Kiss put on a live put just put on Kiss Alive, you've seen them. It's like the same, you know, people, you know, like <laughs> it's, it's not even, he doesn't even say the town anymore. You know, he was always, I was talking to somebody backstage. And it's like, he never says who. He's like <laughs> always just, he was always just talking to somebody about Arkansas. Like he yeah. comes into Arkansas, I was just talking to somebody about Arkansas. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's okay, Paul. We, we The state doesn't rock. You don't have to lie to a, um, at least though he's toned it down. Cause if you go and watch like some of the like eighties era, particularly like crazy nights era, like at the oh, stage yeah. raps were definitely a lot, a lot, a little on the nasty the side. The love gun rap. Yeah. Oh God, the nurse where he's making out with the nurse and then. Yeah. Some lady comes bringing a baby back, and he's like, "That baby had the longest goddamn tongue I've ever seen." And then, and the worst though being if you <laughs> if you ladies get tired of standing, you got a place to sit. Pause. Oh my face! Yes, Paul, we get it. We yeah. get it. You yeah. love pussy. We get it. Yeah, Calm yeah. down, like Jesus. Now he's and, like all embarrassed of that. Oh my god! When he, or when he try like watching him explain it away in his book. Yeah, or poor Eric Carr. Like the worst one is he's like, is it? I can almost quote. God, this is sad because I did see the show a lot. Yeah, I know you ladies look at Eric Carr like he's a little boy, but let me tell you, he's all man. Holy shit! You remember stuff I forgot. <laughs> I, I was at those shows too, man. Holy <laughs> shit! Eighty-seven. That's awesome. That was my senior year of high school. Eighty-seven, eighty-eight. Oh my god! I'll say this though, like the cringier. I mean some of it that wasn't the best era for kiss musically but oh. those shows those shows when they play the older songs are still like kiss or kiss were still like really like a great live act to see it's just oh, it's yeah. like it but if they start fun. sing singing crazy nights you can go to the bathroom <laughs> yeah that, there were there were a few bathroom songs in that set list like during because they were basically like doing the same set for for like three or four albums in a row where mm -hmm. they just like take the new songs out and, and replace it with the current new songs. Yeah. They, they would do like three new, and it was like, it was like the, like 13 song set list with like 45 minutes of talking and then guitar solos and the drum <laughs> solo and the bass solo. And then talk about ripping off your fans, man. Oh God. Well, to quote Ace Fraley, you know, in the great Tom Snyder interview, you know, when Paul's like, oh, people leave our shows crying and Ace like, yeah, they're yeah, like, oh, I spent all that money. <laughs> <laughs> spent all that money oh yeah. my god but um which i don't think anybody's ever left saying that at a boc show probably partially because yeah. boc still are playing club yeah i mean but they're not ripping off their fans like that's kind of the injustice of it all the way where like kiss kiss when's the last time kiss released some truly great music like new music well that's that's a that's a sore spot for a lot of kiss fans kiss fans are the worst and I and I've been I'm a first generation fan. I've been into them since 1976. When right I was on, six, yeah. You know, so I'm allowed to say you know we're allowed to say this stuff. We're we're their, we're fans. We buy this. Yeah. We're allowed to. All right. I think the last great album was music from the Elder, and I'm in uh, my because so many people hate that album. I love the Elder. Thank you. No and people. So many people wrong. love Creatures of the Night. I'm not a fan of Creatures of the Night. I don't. I think it's overrated. Uh, I don't dislike it, but I just think it's overrated. I think the elder's much better. That's just me. I'm weird. Oh no, the elder. I I when people bag on the elder, I always almost want to be like, have you really listened to it? Did you really listen to it with an open mind? Because they're, you know, come on, I uh, Ace's song "Dark Light." That's a great song, and he even does the guitar riff to Jaws opening it. Mm -hmm. I mean, come on, what's how can you not love Ace Frehley? And that's the, the one that like, like, like Lou Reed wrote that with him. Yes, and, and, which makes it even better. Talk about fly on the wall. What I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall in the studio when Lou Reed yes. was with Bob Ezrin and Kiss in the studio. Same. You know, like he had come, like they said, they said that he was there for like a week or something. Mm -hmm. you know? Oh my. 
Well, and it's like the uh, almost like an unholy convergence of two of my intros because I love, I mean, Lou Reed's one of my art saints. And yeah, I love solo Lou Reed. I love, of course, the Velvets. But I also, you know, I love Kiss. I don't love Kiss unconditionally, but I do love Kiss. And I think Kiss sometimes tend to get very, like, as huge as they are, weirdly, I think musically underrated. Because a lot of people just kind of just look at the gimmicks or the latter day stuff. And I realized, yeah. like, no, Kiss, like, when Kiss are great, they're fucking great. That's a great rock band. They were, I was obsessed with them between 1976 and 1979. And, I mean, a lot of that I, I owe to Ace Frehley, you know, his solos. I can't imagine those songs without those guitar solos. They're, yeah. they're songs within the songs. But you know what always pisses me off? When Paul's like, they love to tell this story. I'm sure you know the story. Mm -hmm. uh, they love to remind people, especially Blue Oyster Cult fans. Yeah, well, we started off. We were opening for Blue Oyster Cult. And we opened for them on New Year's Eve. And then the next year, they were opening for us. They like to brag nah. about that concert that where Blue Oyster Cult opened for them uh, at the Nassau Coliseum on Blue Oyster Cult's home turf. What was like your first, um, I don't want to say first impression, but your first like encounter with Blue Oyster Cult? Like where, mm -hmm. like how far back can you remember, like can you remember your first encounters with them? Oh my gosh, absolutely. No, when I, my first sort of awareness of Blue Oyster Cult was when I was really little and uh as a little kid in the 80s and I remember I would hear my mother uh talk about how you know and I'm trying to think like so basically the fact that BOC had this reputation of being a band that like outlaw bikers and this is an era I mean now you know people think bikers they just think oh it could be like a lawyer you know on a you know what I mean like a weekend warrior but back then it wasn't that long ago where like biker meant you really were like an outlaw you were out outside society um and all that like it was very dangerous had this dangerous aura to it and um that bikers and uh people that were into the occult and satan listened to and and she didn't say that's a bad thing so my mother actually loves metal still still did then still does but uh but it just always seemed like whoa like this band you know just i always remember that and this aura like boc just had this sort of like dangerous aura about them and you know you'd see like old pictures of buck darman that all white suit like he's some sort of, sort of like magus or matt is it magus or magus i can spell it <laughs> i know <laughs> what you're talking about you know i don't, know, I don't know how to say yeah. it either like like you know it's like and and the band all throughout their history have like stuff that kind of lends to it like if you look at the um like at the cover of uh agents of fortune uh the tarot deck that the magician has on the cover is clearly the toth deck which was the tarot deck designed by alistair crowley i've never noticed that i've never looked at it that, that long yeah, I'm that kind of nerd, but uh, <laughs> but uh, and then but then I started getting into the music proper, and I mean, of course, I knew all the the ones we all know, like you know, Burning for You and Godzilla, um, and I'm trying to remember what pushed me though to really start de deep diving. It's so funny because with certain bands for me, I can remember the trajectory very cleanly, and other bands, it's almost like it's just like a love thing that just swamps your brain. Like you kind of remember early on how you felt, but nothing's clean as far as like linear, like linear memory. It's just like BOC have always been with me or something. Like I just. Um, Almost like you don't have a memory of first discovering them. They just always been there. Yes. Yes, exactly. Thank like you. You can't pinpoint yeah. something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I said that to I said that to Joey Mullen of Badfinger, the guy in Bad, the guitarist of Badfinger, and like oh, wow. I have like I don't remember playing their records. I don't remember that. I was like saying like Badfinger was always there. Mm -hmm. They were always there. I have like the like my earliest memories. Their music was always there, and I don't know. There's I don't know how to describe it with Bloister Cult. My neighbor's older brothers were always playing them we were like we were kiss fans we were little kids we were seven eight nine ten years old listening to kiss 
and we would sneak into the bedroom when when the older brothers weren't there and look at their other look at their records and they have these blue oyster cult albums and oh, led right zeppelin on. and but i like before getting into them and i guess i didn't realize this until like maybe the into the 90s that when i was younger i had this impression that they were bigger than they actually were if mm. that makes sense like i i I thought that they were like huge, like Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd. And, you know, they were on an arena level for a, mm -hmm. a few years there. Oh, yeah, know? absolutely. And and then I remember thinking like at some point in the like the 90s, I was like, where's Blue Oyster Cult? Like, you mm -hmm. know, or like, did I just stop paying attention? Are they still around? How come they're, you know, they don't release new stuff? How come... They're not on big stadium tours. How come everybody's not talking about like, I was like, were they really that huge? Yeah. You know? So that was my, my first impression of them as a kid. Like they're big, you know, like everybody loves them. And it was a period where they were that big. Yeah. You know? And it's like, it's like, oh my God, like the seventies, like everybody was that big, you know, like everybody was selling out the garden and mm -hmm. like you, you like you look at the number of shows that artists would sell out big places and they were all like and i would so i would hear about these legendary blue oyster cult shows and godzilla comes out and they would so they would tell us you know my friend's older brothers would tell us and so it to us you know we're eight nine ten years old you know this was like wow and so it's like oh i gotta hear this band blue oyster cult so, and I remember like my friend's brother's car, he had this big old white Torino with a black door, like the driver's side door was painted black with, uh -huh. the, with the white, the logo, you know, it was like that. Oh, half, it was like symbol. a cross and a question mark. It was like half, yeah. half question mark, the symbol. And so I used to see that. And then I would lean into the car, you know, you're a little kid trying to hang out with the older kid, you know, you'd lean into the car and and I would always see like the cult, the, the cult, the Saurus Erectus eight track because yes. that, that was the new album at the time. So everybody had that. And I would look at it. And I would just like stare at the cover as much as I can. And then I would go into the bedroom, the kid's bedroom and look at the look at the vinyl. And I would just stare at that thing like, wow, what does this sound like? You know, this has got to be awesome, you know. And they'd yeah. be like, oh, Kiss, Kiss stinks. What are you going to listen to this? Listen to Led Zeppelin. Listen to Blue Oyster Cult. So, um. <laughs> But it's funny when you said, you know, like um, the stuff that everybody knows and like, um, like I never looked at Agents of Fortune that much, like the cover. Mm -hmm. uh, I borrowed some Enchanted Evening and uh, on, oh. your, on Your Feet. And yes. so like, and then the first Blue Oyster Cult record I got was Extraterrestrial Live. Oh. Christmas 1982. So the first, my first exposure to Blue Oyster Cult was all live. So yes. I hadn't even heard any studio Blue Oyster Cult except for what was on the radio. Yeah. You know? Oh, and so, yeah, it was weird. Like I would see like Burning For You, which was like brand new at the time. Like when I, you know, when I finally got like Extraterrestrial Live, that was mm -hmm. like Fire of Unknown Origins tour. Oh. You no, know, so uh, I would at, at that point we MTV appeared, mm -hmm. so we would see "Burning for You" all the time, and everybody had "Fire of Unknown Origin." Yeah, but it wasn't until later that I went back and because um, I got you know I went through metal, I went through a metal phase, and um, later on. I went back and got the CDs of the so of the studio albums. Nice. Later yeah. than vinyl. Most of my entire experience with Blue Oyster Cult as a kid was live. There's you nothing know, wrong with that. Like the, the, the live version of Joan Crawford scared the shit out of me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I could I could tell, especially in some of those lyrics. I always love the was it about the policemen having was that their eyes are the color of frozen meat. Like, yeah yeah fuck? yeah <laughs> holy crap you just see you just brought that memory back i haven't thought about that in years yes and you know that video was actually one of the early music videos banned from mtv was the john crawford one yeah i didn't know that yeah because i guess the whole image of sort of these like 
schoolgirls at one point it appears they may have that they have definitely murdered a guy and may have drank his blood or cannibalized him a little bit and i guess that was just and there's a great shot where one of the girls just smiles and her teeth are all bloody and um that was i guess just too much too much from tv you have but, like all um, these, you have a lot of factoids on mtv it's, I, it's like <laughs> things i never knew another thing i that you like a little off slightly off topic really quick mm -hmm. You did a, a piece on like MTV, like a lot of the stuff of the 80s, like a lot of like like when the whole nuclear thing happened. Oh, yes. And, and the day after was being mm. shown in threads and, and movies like that that were meant to scare the crap out of you when, when you know, when you were a kid. Um, oh, yeah. You did an article, I think it was two like two minutes to midnight. Yes. Right, on that stuff. Like, I thought that was really great. Just like speaking of MTV. I remember one day uh, an ad appears on MTV mm -hmm. for the new Blue Oyster Cult album, The Revolution by Night. And I think, I'm just speaking personally, I don't know what the consent, if there's a consensus among Blue Oyster Cult fans, how that album went over. I don't mm -hmm. remember if it flopped or what happened, but like that was like, and maybe it was just me getting into metal. Yeah. Oyster Cult was not going in that direction. You know, they kind of evolved in a different way where they kind of almost like got really commercial, like commercial mm -hmm. pop, like the next two albums. But um, that album, I remember that album didn't sit very well with me. It seemed like they were doing, they were trying to pick up on trends of what, where the 80s were going, mm -hmm. you know, like, but the 80s hadn't really fully become the 80s yet, if that makes sense. They're yeah. they like toying with synthesizers a little bit. And I think like a few years later when they did Club Ninja, oh, <laughs> they they went all the way in, you know, and it was kind of like Club Ninja was kind of like what they were dabbling with on Revolution by Night. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know. Like, what are do you have any specific impressions of either of those records? Oh gosh, I I don't <laughs> I don't dislike either of them. I like both of them, but I I actually I actually like Club Ninja more. Uh, weirdly enough, I do too. If like Club Ninja, from what I could tell, is the one that people tend to like. Fans are like, oh god, and uh, now do I think either either albums that strong? No, I mean they're definitely if you're gonna pick some like the weakest of of the discography yeah those two are that's gonna fit it i mean i will see revolution by night does have the strong uh hand of having because i believe take uh take me away is on that album and that's a great great song with a, another just wonderful vocal performance of eric bloom who i think is one of i think the whole band's obviously very underrated but eric bloom could like be so like diverse with his vocals and the power of his voice because he could sing something very heartfelt and then also uh, but then another time sound almost like evil like the like I mean, it's like he's so yeah. great um but yeah, i don't think either album i mean there are bands that f i think fared way way worse in the 80s than blue oyster Cold. oh definitely, uh, definitely i mean the 80s i mean I mean, oh, the 80s were rough. The 80s, I think, were rough, especially for older bands, because and part of it, I think some of it is I wonder if the production had been different, because a little bit, I mean, Blizzard Cold always had keyboards. You know, they were not like an anti-keyboard band necessarily, but 80s production in general just had, got so shiny sounding and so slick sounding that I feel like it's, there are certain rock bands where if they're, you know, if the production lent that way, it kind of gutted that band a little bit. I don't think BOC quite fared as bad on that front as others, but um, yeah, and I do think they did kind of a return to form with Imaginos, which I think is a better a better album than both of those. Uh, but yeah, I think also what probably didn't help you is that's coming off Fire of Unknown Origin, which I think is one of their best albums. That album is like all killer, no filler, pretty much. I mean, you get Veteran of the Psychic Wars on that album, which is such a tremendous song. Well, I think uh, like the best thing that I mm -hmm. think that they ever did, it's just, you know, Buck Dharma, especially, is that the live version of Veteran of Psychic Wars, mm. which is the one that I grew up on. Yes. Uh, I, I never had Fire of Unknown Origin until like maybe five, six years later, mm -hmm. everything I knew from that record was, was live or 
what my friend was playing on his cassette because I did have friends who had it. So I knew it, mm -hmm. but uh, it wasn't until and w when Imaginos came out, um, I played it the entire summer of 88. That was the summer I graduated high school. And I remember it came out, but I was like, I had gone through metal mm -hmm. and then I started listening to stuff. Like I went back and became a hippie, you know, <laughs> and, and then I was, you know, I was listening to Bob Dylan and, and REM and, and things like that, but, and Jefferson airplane. And, but Imaginos came out and at that point I kind of lost interest Mm -hmm. You know, and the reason I bring up Revolution by Night and, and Club Ninja is because like my exploration of Blue Oyster Cult was cut short by those albums because, yeah. again, my musical direction went elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And so I never had a chance to properly get into everything before 1980, 81 until oh, wow. my 30s. And then it wasn't until like, like I went through the, my entire twenties, not listening like Blue Oyster Cult. My life had there was no Blue Oyster Cult in my life, mm -hmm. you know, unless somebody brought them up. It's like, oh yeah, I, li I listened to them when I was a kid. And then I realized oh. one day, I was like, holy shit! Like I know, I know these albums. I've held these albums in my hand, you know, Tyranny and Mutations, and you know, uh, Secret Treaties and all that stuff. Yes. I've owned these record covers my whole life. Let me go back and get into them. Let me, let me hear them, you know? And so I went and got them on CD at that point and I loved it. I was like, my God, like I was this close, you know, to, to, to hearing or having this stuff in my life, you know, but again, metal happens. You're a teenager in 1983, 84. It, that's where you went. Most kids. Yeah. Um, I mean, I knew a lot of it because I, I knew them as live versions. So dominance and submission in city town mm. and, and Dr. Music, you know, from Mirrors, you know, like even that stuff oh. was good because I knew it. I, you mm -hmm. know, I think this stuff is like all familiar, but then there were gems that I'd never heard until like I was like, until like the year 2000. That whole discography is such a, is such a treasure trove and the deep cuts, you know, and I mean, that I guess that's nothing new, but like some of the deeper cuts end up being really rewarding and and also very surprising. That's the thing is, is BOC is a band, unlike so many other bands that they probably get lumped next to because of, I think as a classic rock radio, they tend to be kind of put in that category, but I've never thought that was really fair because they have ties to Patti Smith. They have ties to, you know, sci-fi writer, My Michael Moorcock. They are a huge influence on Stephen King. Uh, and like their, their reach kind of goes a, yeah. a lot bigger than that. Um, they even did the soundtrack for um, a full moon pictures movie called Bad Channels, which isn't that great of a movie, <laughs> but the soundtrack's really interesting. And actually that band does feature, or that band, that movie features a really cool, um, very weird band that was out of, I think St. Louis called Psychotic Symphony. This is an aside, mm -hmm. but if you do see that movie, the Psychotic Symphony section is fucking awesome especially if you're into bands like mr bungle and stuff like that you'll love you'll love that section of the movie uh -huh. but um but yeah but no boc um and i love the fact that you mentioned like mirrors and i think cult source of rectus is another album that i don't i feel like doesn't get mentioned enough uh because i think it's a tremendous album I mean, it's, it's got monsters oh monsters yeah yes divine win or deadline oh divine win I love Deadline, though. I do. I do love Deadline. <laughs> that hurt a little bit. All right. All right. Um, monsters or Black Blade? <gasps> oh, oh. <laughs> Just why would monsters. You... Oh, my God. Why would you do that oh, to so me? Oh, fuck. I love. Oh, oh, man. That hurts. Cause, oh, mm. they're my uh, babies. I can't I choose know. between my babies. I'm gonna have to. Oh God. Okay, Black Blade. Yeah, I, I got to go with Black Blade. I would. I wouldn't have taken as long, but I would. I would definitely say Black Blade. I love um, monsters so much. All right. All right. But, Here's uh, a hard one. Secret Treaties or the first album. Ooh. Because I consider them equals, to be honest. Um, yeah. I'll, I, to the point, I'll, I'll make a confession. I sometimes will mix up track listings on those for some reason. Like I do too, because only because yeah. I, everything to me was live. So I was like, what, what album was that on again? What album was that on again? You know? Yeah, exactly. Oh. Um, Secret Treaties. 
Just go okay, with I would, the guy. I, I would take the first one. Uh, Joan Crawford or Vera Gemini? Oh, Joan Crawford, 100%. I'm not a big fan of Vera Gemini. That's actually one of my least favorite tracks off of Agents of Fortune. Yeah. I love I love Patti Smith, for the record, but um, that one, that's... That Patti's one my true. favorite artist. That's yeah, no, yeah. Patty's Patty's legend. Like, uh, but that one in true confessions, I always tend to kind of skip past a little bit on Agents of Portion. I don't I don't hate anything on that album for the record, but yeah, there's just yeah. songs I would rather get to. <laughs> um also Judas Priest, if you were playing that one with me. I mean Judas Priest versus Iron Maiden, I would pick I would pick Priest. Oh, me too. The week yeah. we in high school in high school and like in the 80s, man, you had your maiden kids and you had your priest kids. Oh god, you know? who were the tougher? Who were like the the scarier kids? The scarier kids were definitely the maiden kids, but then mm -hmm. like when see like 86 around by the time of 86 thrash had taken over everything. So you right. had your slayer kids mm -hmm. who were like the most fucked up. You know, like <laughs> nobody messed with the, the Slayer kids, you know, it's like <laughs> nothing was heavy enough. Nothing was fast enough. Everything just became like this band's faster than this band. And this yeah. band is heavier and this band is more satanic. And it just became like to the point where everybody started just like totally like ripping on Priest and Maiden for being posers because they didn't play <laughs> as fast as Slayer. And it wasn't as dark as Venom. And it was, you know, and it everything just became... You know, like the, the Slayer fans took over, like all within the course of the year, like 86 begins with like the 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 big metal acts, basically Priest and Maiden, mm -hmm. you know, and Ozzy turning all colorful. They got their synth guitars. They, <laughs> they finally discovered Hairspray. You know, Ozzy, the Prince of fucking Darkness is walking around in a sequin robe. You know, that's that was the year that metal went colorful. And mm -hmm. then by the end of 86, you have, you know, Rain and Blood has come out. Master of Puppets has come out. You know? Oh, yeah. Um, it, it's like, you know, Anthrax had Among the Living. Uh, it, everything just went in such a different direction that mm -hmm. the stuff that was so that was big and the center of everything just a year or two before was now you know metal became divided the fans were just like you know th they overused words like poser and you know like what man of war would call false metal yeah and it really became about that you know <laughs> and it was you know i'm sorry but man of war always made me smile you know, yeah like, um... note i now play be a black arrow of death sent <laughs> to the hearts of those of you who play false metal yeah, you know? it's, it's totally like some eight sided die metal. I always feel like with Vanna War, it's like somebody needs to be like, okay, who's the dungeon master? Yeah, yeah. who's got to be the cleric? Yeah, um, <laughs> which in fairness, I'm sure there were some DD players listening to Blue Oyster Cult too, but uh, uh, but yeah, that um, that's such a fun game though, but boy, that's hard that one because Black Blade like hasn't even has another tie for me because of course it's about Elric, like my you know of michael moorcox like elric saga and of course hawkwind is a band that did a whole album you know about elric and i'm a huge hawkwind fan so it's mm -hmm. like my heart's like pulled doubly <laughs> so with that one what about like with like like there's there's albums like spectrus oh and, um mi mirrors i yeah. i did a whole article on spectre sorry i did not mean to interrupt did you? you yeah yeah, that I have to read. I love Spectres. I think Mirrors is really, I think those are two like very kind of like unsung albums. Um, Spectres is actually one of my favorites. Um, it's a weird, it's weird. It's just a. It's very weird. Is that like, all right, let me, is that their identity crisis record? Like that and Mirrors together? Do they? No, no. I I feel like in, in in some ways, if you really, especially if you listen to, that's one of the things I love about when you when about writing about music is that's when I'm kind of forced to really dive into lyrics. I don't always dive into lyrics on my own. If I'm just listening to something, I sometimes do, but it's a little more hit and miss. But if I'm if I'm writing about it, it's like okay, we need to understand all the machinacia here. And with Spectres, like there's such a darkness 
and a weirdness to it that I feel like has always been something I've really treasured about that band throughout their entire history is there is just something very um not cheesy dark though like shadows like voc is a band that definitely yeah, plays a lot yeah. with shadows and even even the stuff that surface level might not seem like it um because there's like a song on there called going through the motions which i don't know why that wasn't a single because that song would have been perfect for radio it's a great catchy seemingly upbeat song but then if you break down the lyrics it's a nasty kind of almost mean-spirited song about like hooking up with the groupie and you know it's it's so cynical and sad and yeah. the fact that they were going they were willing to kind of plumb that depths at that point in their career where they're still a very huge band um and, and it's not just it's not this cheesy shit like oh love you forever baby as long as you touch my dick you know it's not like right. that where a lot of those pants were yeah. like it's like it's just straight up being kind of almost like too honest and too raw but if you don't listen to the words it just sounds like you know like yeah we're going through that you know it has like this almost poppy sensibility but you just scratch a little bit under the surface and there's something else and plus that album has two songs about vampires i mean what's more goth than that were there singles on that record? Uh, yeah, Godzilla. Godzilla was a single. Wow, wasn't it? See, I knew. A... I don't. I don't know. I'm. I'm, I'm asking because like this. Like this. I don't know. I always wondered about like, like how come. I mean, maybe it was. Maybe it was, and it just didn't go anywhere on on FM radio. Oh wow! I feel like I've heard it on the radio. But granted, I wasn't. I, like, I hear it now, like over the past right. ten years. Did you not hear it? Because honestly, I was born in nineteen eighty. Okay. So I wasn't. So I don't. So I'm, ten, I'm ten years older than you. Okay. So, yeah. All right. So I in eighty that so that was the year Cultosaurus Erectus came out. So. I just have no memory of hearing any any songs on the radio from those two records, Mirrors mm -hmm. and Spectres, you know? And oh, wow. Yeah, there was just, they were like no place to be found. Like you would hear from the Blue Oyster Cult fans and uh, you would hear about Godzilla Live. That was part of the legend of that group. Right. You know? Like when you went to see Blue Oyster Cult, Godzilla, and this was before all of like the big stage theatrics of heavy metal. You know, mm -hmm. when Judas Priest had the Italian rising from the stage, you know, <laughs> and then the turbo robot, you know. And, yes. but, I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they were innovative. But you know what? Blue Oyster Cult had the Godzilla thing, which kind of looks funny now. Like I looked up, I was looking up videos from like the 1977 tour mm -hmm. and um, the Fire of Unknown Origin tour, which was probably the big, that was them at their their peak of popularity, like 1981, 82. Mm -hmm. That was their, you know, commercial peak uh, where they were selling the most concert tickets. They were selling the most albums. Everybody went back and bought Agents of Fortune based on, you know, uh, Fire of Unknown Origin, you know, the, first, the second wave, you know, the younger mm -hmm. kids. And that those younger kids were my age because the older kids already had Agents of Fortune when it came out. Oh, you know? okay. Yeah. So we were the little kids there now in middle school discovering like, wow, there's this band Blue Oyster Cult, you know? Uh, hello, they've been around for 10 years, <laughs> you know? Uh, I guess it was kind of like the kids when the, there were kids, and I don't know if you can believe this or not, but there were kids when Lick It Up came out and Kiss took the makeup off. Mm -hmm. There were kids that thought there was this new band out called Kiss with their, their first album, Lick It Up. Oh wow! Yeah. <laughs> oh man. So yeah, that's a great album though. So good for them. They picked it. <laughs> they picked good. a good. They picked a good one with no no makeup kiss. Um, I mean, as opposed to being. Can you imagine if you thought like, fucking crazy nights are hot in the shade? And and, oh. and this was just and this was just like <laughs> after like everybody was like could, you couldn't get arrested. Kiss couldn't get arrested. It was like you know, uh, kiss. Oh, they suck. They suck. They suck. They suck. They suck. You know, and that's all you heard. Yeah. Right. And it's like, oh, did you hear Kiss? Like, like they took their makeup off. Don't they sound great? Come on, people. Oh. And that's the thing is like with any band, I think that does anything visual and they get known for that. That's always kind of across 
that they kind of have to bear as far as ever being respected in a lot of ways. Cause like, I mean, I think Alice Cooper's respected now, but like I mentioned yeah. the tubes earlier. I don't think the tubes have ever gotten their just due because yeah. they were associated with having a stage show. Um, kiss I guess anybody's theatrical right yeah yeah and it's and that's and that's and it's silly it's like oh god forbid you do something multimedia what happens to genesis if peter gabriel never leaves totally i just out of nowhere just just a random question i know i love it just it, came yeah. into my head but here's the thing though they were already that's the weird thing like genesis is a weird thing because like they were already in arenas based mm. on like no hit songs they were just like selling albums that's a weird thing. Like, like class right. rock was able to do this in the seventies without radio. Yeah, yeah. You had album bands. Yeah, so that's a, that's an excellent point. And it is like it does seem like such an alien um, thing now. Of course, now I mean, I don't. That's kind of the cool thing. It's like the landscape's always changing. And yeah, but uh, but no, that's a really good point. Especially because there were a lot of prog bands. Prog is a great example where. I mean, it's harder to have hit singles when your songs are like six, <laughs> you know, six, seven, yeah. eight minutes long. But, uh, but yeah. Do, do we know what, do we know what Lester Banks thought of Blue Oyster Cult? I don't know uh, this. I'm, I'm just wondering. Oh gosh. I, I have don't know if I've ever read anything or any, anything that he said about them. I'm trying to remember because I've read a lot of, I've read a lot of Lester and I still like go back and reread because um, I am, I am that girl. I have that nerd. Uh, I love Lester. I'm saying we're getting to talk about Lester too. Um, in fact, when you mentioned like earlier about channeling my inner Lester bank, that is like one of the most easy ways to make me fangirl as a compliment. If anybody invokes Lester, I'm like, oh my God. Like, um, Well, that's I why, I, that's why I read yeah. the thing back to you. Cause it blew me away. Cause I realized like we're from the same school. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I can't remember. I think, I, he would, I think he would have loved them. I think so, especially because Lester actually was one of the few, if not only, um, and certainly of the big dog kind of yeah. music critics that time period that really championed metal. And he'd go on to champion like punk and no wave too. And, you know, that's the, uh, where people, I mean, anything that even smacked of heavy metal back then, most critics just like wrote it off. Um, right. But I think he, I think he missed it. I think he just missed metal. You know what I mean? Because, mm -hmm. well, metal, what, what became metal, you know? There right. Was, writers would use the word metal in the 70s, but it really, I don't know. I, it, it was it was metal for that time period, but I told, I, yeah. I get, because 80s metal and 70s metal, 70s metal is now pretty much hard rock and what we call hard rock. Yeah. But at that time period, I mean, yeah, that's, that's heavy for that time period. But then you go into 80s and yeah, you're getting new sounds and bands that are really kind of, I mean, now I get, I mean, cause like I love Merciful Fate and yeah, but I can understand being like, well, yeah, that's metal. But if you're saying Steppenwolf's metal and Merciful, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's yeah, like, okay, yeah. there's a, there's a bit of a difference, but um, to say the least, um, I think, I, I hope, I hope Lester. Now, granted, um, I, there, there are plenty of times where like, there are things where I'm like, oh man, like Lester did like, but that's, that's okay. Like the writing's great. And that's ultimately as any creative you know, if your voice and vision are compelling, and obviously Lester was like the master and is forever the master of that, um, you don't have to fuck it. You don't have to agree with them. Like, who wants to? Who wants to be in an echo chamber necessarily? Like, it's it's interesting. If somebody's got a great view, what do they think of it? Unlike, say, like, and I will name names here. Uh, Chris Gow, Robert Chris Gow, who just, oh, like he that was a cat with no rock and roll authority to invoke Kim Fowley. <laughs> this is one of my favorite phrases ever. Like what a great insult to tell somebody they have no rock and roll authority. Um, and just a guy that never was never cool. He never got rock and roll. Uh, he's still alive. Um, you know, for what it's worth, honestly, I've, I've written a lot about the tubes and some of his review of the tubes albums are just like, they're dumb I and mean, it's not that i just it's not just because i disagree with him it's just his points are lame he's just lame and somebody actually had the fucking gall to make a movie about him called rock and roll animal are you shitting me robert Criscale? are you kidding I me i've seen bits, bits and pieces of that oh rock and roll animal my ass like fuck yeah. 
what's what's i mean what's next are we going to make a make a movie called heavy metal warrior starring paul anka it's bullshit <laughs> robert chris gal rock and roll had, had my ass. Had heavy metal warrior he's more heavy metal than fucking chris gal like yeah. god <laughs> that guy oh i'm sorry on, on on a positive note lester is king and everybody should read lester books, i haven't you know? to tell you the truth i haven't paid too much attention to chris gal don't. You know, and I was a big, I was a big Village Voice <laughs> reader for for decades. You know, and maybe I just missed the whole. Yeah, you know, he was the guy that did like the jazz, the Paz and Jop Awards at the end of the year. Is Ugh. that that right? He probably did. He was also yeah. like he would like a school teacher be like, "This album C minus." Like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, what the what the. F- grades this is grades <laughs> this is art motherfucker like don't yeah. be fucking oh c minus i got your c minus right here now <laughs> this oh yeah he's the worst rock and roll animal fuck like that's yeah. that's adorable <laughs> i read like a lot of stuff today like well I, I, it's not that's not true it, when i read stuff today it just seems like it's like paid advertisements for, mm-hmm. for, for, for albums, you know, kind of like what, what Rolling Stone was doing while Lester was still alive, you know, yeah. make the band look good. This is great. It's very one dimensional on the surface. This is great. Very formulaic structured, no honesty, no challenge, like no, 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 no humor, no sense of humor at the expense of the art or the artist, like any of those things that, you would get in cream or anything that was, you know, that, that had anything to do with Lester or, or Robert mm-hmm. Duncan or any of those guys. Oh man. I love, I'm so glad you mentioned Robert Duncan. I love Robert Duncan. And he's, have yeah. you read his book Loudmouth? I talked to him on this. Oh podcast. shit. Well, you know yeah. what I'm downloading after this. Oh <laughs> yeah. That's so cool. Are you saying I get to be on the same show that Robert Duncan was on? Oh my he's, goodness. he's, he's a trip, man. <laughs> he's, he's, a trip. he's amazing. Love him. And he's like a vampire. I can't believe like, how did that guy write for cream? He looks amazing. He looks so good. Yeah. He looks better than Chris. He Young. looks better now than he did then. You know? <laughs> yeah, he looks great. He's got the, he's totally got like the heartbreakers, like polka dots on. I was thinking of like you Johnny know, Thunders he with that. that. He mentioned that last week. He was just like, man, he posted a picture of himself on Facebook. And uh, he's like, yeah, man, I got the polka dot shirt back. I said, yeah, that's from the first leg of the Loudmouth tour. I remember yeah. that. I was, like, <laughs> I was like, man, I was like, we only did an audio interview. And I talked to him on the phone. Mm. And, um, I didn't see him. We weren't, I wasn't doing zoom yet like this. So yeah. we were just talking on the phone. I was like, yeah, I know we did a phone interview, but I'd like to think you were wearing that polka dot shirt while you were talking to me. <laughs> oh, you know, he was, you know, yeah. he was just like, because like can't... he was like that summer, it was like, like the summer of 2020. And he was like wearing that shirt for every interview. And we did like, he did a reading mm-hmm. with um, three rooms press. Like they were the, they were, that's his publisher. And so he did like an online thing. Now, every time though, I love the polka dots. I just keep expecting him to be like, you know, have some story about Walter Lur, you know, like it's totally just like such a great New York, like I, punk look. You know, I always think about like Lester for somebody who like by the 1980s, he, he kind of had this thing like, like rocks become irrelevant how would he survive the 21st century? You know, he, he had already expressed his disappointment in the way rock had become like just another commodity, you know, mm-hmm. like, like you, you figure corporate rock peaks around 76, 78 record companies are overextending themselves because of that. Right. They start spending millions more than they should have spent by like 79. Like you, you know, you, you start hearing like the industries in decline. Mm-hmm. The summer of 79, you have you have records like Bad Girls and um, Ring My Bell at the top of the charts and all these disco songs at the top of the charts. You know, the industry does an about face and like out of nowhere, they hit the brakes. Disco's dead. This is the knack. Here's my Sharona. Fuck you. Disco's dead. Here's New Wave. You know, just like that. And yeah. like Lester catches on to that instantly you know like it like i i i heard an interview with him 
um, that he did with um, the hell's her name. Oh, was it Sue Matthews? Sue Matthews, yes, 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 yeah. Um, and he's just like ranting about like who gets to decide? Who are these people that decide? Like, yes. who just says that disco is dead and this is new wave and like new now new wave is going to be big. He was ranting about sticks, <laughs> you know, like who <laughs> are these people? You know, um, oh, but, but like, but I remember it. That's the weird thing. I was in like the summer of nineteen seventy nine. I'm nine years old. Okay. I'm, I was like going from third grade to fourth grade and we went back to school and the kids were going, did you hear? Disco is dead. Like there's no more disco. Like, like people used to wear shirts that said death before disco. Yeah. You know? They had this big Comiskey Park thing in Chicago where they blew up the albums, you know, uh, mm -hmm. they, they blew up a bunch of disco records. But it was just like, you know, as, as a little kid, you're very impressionable. So you're like, oh, did you hear? They said disco is dead. Like, really? Like, they, how did it die? Was it killed? Was it murdered? Like, you know, <laughs> like, like, I get what do you mean? Disco's dead. Like, I heard it on the radio. But Lester, you know, he he calls it out immediately, um, almost as fast as it's happening. Um, yeah. And there's there's times when I think about it, and I get kind of sad for the things that he missed that he didn't get to see, you know, and he wasn't around. Like, oh. um, he kind of like just missed MTV's explosion. That second mm -hmm. British invasion that happened in the early 80s, mm -hmm. you know. Live aid, like, like he would have had a ball with live oh, aid. Oh my God. Know? Can you imagine? He would have oh. had a ball with Bono. Oh. He, he was like, you know, because he was very anti rock star, you know, he yeah. didn't think that the star system should exist in music the way it did in Hollywood. Oh you know? God. Can you imagine him reviewing like Rattle? Was it Rattle and Hum, the, the concert right. film? Yeah, yeah. Oh God, Rubano! Oh, I, this makes me cringe so hard. Even just thinking about—is that the one where they go into Sun Studios or something and they, yes. and they jam with um, um, BB King? I think it's it's totally like yeah. a Spinal Tap moment. It's but no, but he opens the film before they like cover Helter Skelter, and he's like, "We're taking this song back from Charles Manson and giving it to the Beatles." And it's like, you dumbass! That's not how any of this works. But I always like to think that when Skinny Puppy sampled uh, Charles Manson singing part of Helter Skelter of their song Warlock, that Skinny Puppy was taking it back from the Beatles and giving it right back to Charlie, like just to, just as a fuck you to Bono. <laughs> but yeah, no, I. I think we've all, like any of us who, you know, love, love the man's work, have, have wondered that. I definitely, you know, I, I kind of wish like something would have happened where he could have had like, you know, to read a lot about him where he wanted kind of a break to get, to go just work on like some fiction, to work on his novel. And I feel like, man, maybe like the what if game is stupid because it doesn't get you anything, but it's like maybe you have had You happened. can't help think about it though. Yes, like, you know, I know. Because, because of the way. All right. I, I gotta I gotta quote you. I gotta I'm just gonna go back to something you you said. Oh my god. Okay. No, no, no. And, and it was in and it was and, and I think it was in your Blue Oyster Cult review. You mentioned what you referred to as the defanging of rock and roll. Yes. You know, where this thing that was once dangerous mm -hmm. and made you feel alive and, and scared the shit out of your parents became safe and proper and polite and kind of um you know like the uh what's the the big clear channel in the body of payola uh, thing that's going on you know yeah and, um you know i call it the castration of rock you know the defanging of rock Wait, same mm -hmm. thing you know, that's hundred um, percent. And I think that exists. The same thing exists in journalism, in writing. My favorite, my, one of my favorite Lester stories is when he he um he gave a bad review to Frank Zappa, and Frank Zappa called up the magazine and said, "Well, I I bought a fifteen hundred dollar ad, you know, in Cream, and and he's like, you you owe you know you owe Frank Zappa an apology. You're going to write this letter, and you're going to write, and he's like, well, you know." If, if that's the best, he said something to the effect of like uh, paying for like a $2,000 ad is the best excuse for a good review I've ever seen, you know? Do, do you know what, you know the story I'm talking about? Like I, I do. I'm paraphrasing, I'm paraphrasing. I don't know if I, you're probably telling a story. No, 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 I know, I know exactly, yeah. But, you know, like, like, yeah, yeah. What if, what if is kind of 
senseless. But yeah. I can't help wonder like how he would reconcile the past 40 years mm-hmm. that the things that he missed with the thoughts and concerns about Rock's future that he yeah. expressed in the years before he died. You know what I mean? Because there were cert- there were so many things that he hit on that he was just spot on about the future. You know? Yeah. I think about how it, it, it would near the end of the seventies, he was talking about the nostalgia culture mm-hmm. that had developed for the, for the fifties in the seventies, you know, and that there was American graffiti and happy days and Shanana and that everything had basically come full circle with the fifties. Mm-hmm. What I don't think he knew was that, these cycles would keep going on and on as time went on. So, you know, by the end of the eighties, the sixties came back. And by the end of the nineties, the seventies came back. Yeah. And by the end of the, you know, the two thousands, the eighties came back, like everything kind of takes like, like 10 years after the fact, it's so out of style and out of fashion, like, like you can't get arrested. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then 20 years later, it comes full circle again. And like maybe like the next generation kind of has this nostalgia for it. Or maybe yeah. their parents do. And then the, and then the kids have this romanticized mythic version of whatever that was because they were too young or they just missed it. And it's it's always I mean, I think nostalgia is such a dangerous thing, personally, because it's 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 a it's such a clouded view of the past where you're not getting to see everything for what it really was. Yeah. And and I think there's a difference between like visiting or learning about because if something is new to you, then it's new. Yeah. You know, like you can listen to a piece of music from the 20s. And if you ever heard it before, that can expand your mind in, in, in such a cool way. And I love doing that. And, and you can revisit something that's familiar to you too, but there's a huge difference between being like, I'm going to listen to this Pharaoh Sanders album from the past. And then I'll listen to, you know, uh, Patri- you know we mentioned Patriarchy earlier, you know, or we'll listen to Spectres or, you know, we'll listen to, you know, Hanoi rocks or you know what I mean like you listen to things past and present but the the problem with nostalgia is there's this like almost attitude of well things were better then and that's bullshit that's a lie don't ever buy it um especially because and every generation does this where they're like well we knew what good music was you kids and it's like you know there's always that element and every fucking generation does it we're we're seeing it now oh we're seeing it happening now but and you're right every generation but we've only seen like one or two generations do it in terms of modern pop music like the the rock Mm. era with casey Kasem called the rock era yeah so right now it's like the baby boomers and now it's like Gen X who have become Gen X is now in their fifties, you know, forties yeah. and fifties. And we're the ones saying, Oh, it was better then, you know, not necessarily you and me. Right. But it's like our generation and the boom baby boomers, you know, like our parents' generation who the entire market, the entire rock market is based on 25th anniversary box sets, 50th mm. anniversary box sets. <laughs> Everything is just box sets. Like every album that like any artist over 50 is putting out is most likely not music, but a box set to commemorate the 25th anniversary of this, the 40th anniversary of that. We sold it 40 years ago. Let's sell it again. But with, you know, it, you know what I mean? And it just yeah. seems like, you know, All of the artists that are selling out arenas and the stadiums and, you know, the biggest, like all the biggest draws are all artists over the age of 60. You know, it's all like the entire rock model has been based on nostalgia. And I don't know to what extent he saw this coming. I don't think he really had any clue what was coming. You know, I think because Lester always contemplated that question of can rock stars do it in their 40s? Mm-hmm. And he encouraged it you know he was like yeah man i think i think the stone should play into their 60s until they just like keel over and die on stage if they and if an artist can do it in their 50s sure you know yeah i mean and now the stones are pushing 80 
Oh God. It's, it's crazy. I think the thing that, that makes me sad is like, there's parts of that that are bands that are either like where there's like no founding members touring, or there might be one founding member and, you know, or even a guy, it's like, it starts getting to the point where like, this isn't, I mean, cause I think like the most famous case is foreigner. Yeah. I was just going to say. Yeah. Cause half the time Mick Jones, like, who I think is the only retained member left of, of the original lineup half the time he's not even on that stage. So whatever people are paying for it now, but one could argue, are most of the people going to see them? Do they give a shit? Are they hardcore fans? Probably not. They're going there to hear cold as ice. Um, I'm not a foreigner fan for the record, but it's like, but that's like, part of me is sad. I mean, it's like, I remember getting irritated at the Blue Oyster Cult show when some drunk guy behind me kept yelling Godzilla. And I just totally wanted to like, yeah do like a little chuck yeah. morris like little face punch but I, uh but the crowd as a whole were actually very respectful and yeah the thing i respect about bands like blues or cult or another band this is you know uh is like the flesh tones because they put out a new album two years ago and that album that's a band that keeps getting like they've always been great they keep getting better um there's a band out of the uk shriek back that have been around since the early 80s they just put out a new album so mm-hmm. i I love seeing these bands that are not using a legacy to just rest on their laurels. Like the Stones, the Stones haven't done a new, I mean, the last new, what was the last actual new album of like original material they did? Was it Seal Wheels? No, they had a few after that, but it's been a good almost it's been a few, 20 years. Yeah. And like I mean, Steel Wheels, Voodoo Lounge, Bridges to Bell. Oh, and, you're uh, right. Um, there might there was, be a reason why I forgot some. <laughs> a bigger bang a bigger bang was their last one yeah so they're working on something new but that's the thing though like the stones will come back and every time the stones come back with a new album nobody gives a shit nobody yeah. cares you know that even even live nobody wants to hear the new stuff live it's 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 the pee break song you mm. know it's like everybody gets up and you know gets a beer or goes to the bathroom or something and then there are, you know, there's, I'm, I'm sure there is a small percentage of hard, like really hardcore fans that are looking forward to new Stones music. You know, somebody yeah. has Paul Stanley just last week, you know, is there a new Kiss album? And is there one more album? He's like, what's the point? Nobody cares. You know, nobody wants, you know, but I, I, I mean, I'm more with the, I would rather an artist continue to make new stuff. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and to be honest with Kit, and I mean, as much as we've talked about kiss and obviously you and i have a lot of stuff with kiss we love but when paul says who cares well that's why nobody cares because that's the energy going into the new music that was made yeah like because you hear like when you listen to like that latest flesh tones album when you listen to the symbol remains of cloister cult there's there's an energy there these are still guys that love creating and exploring and and making new stuff that they're excited about and I, and that's the thing is i don't i don't i think most people aren't inherently stupid they, they can sense if somebody's like just playing them for a chump and some people don't care i mean people a lot of people that are just going to hear the hits those aren't really fans those are just people that you know are looking to grab a white claw or a butt ultra or whatever the fuck and, and, and it could be blue you know? cold or it could be journey that's the show they're going to it Ex- exactly you know? But I think as far as like actual like people that are like us, like people that just love music, like that aren't casual listeners, like this is part of our passion. This is part of our life. Like we, yeah. we sense that it's like your spidey senses are tingling when somebody's just kind of like taking you for a ride and just being like shitting it out. And it's like, well, no, I'm not going to give my money or my time to somebody that's just going to, you know, treat me like the worst kind of carny yeah um and and that's and actually going back to lester to me the thing i would love to see any writer it doesn't have to be music it could be film any cultural writer shit maybe even poetry and prose because that's the thing lester was so prosy and poetic with this language too is that you know look at the heart look at the humanity look at the intelligence it wasn't just that he would you know he yeah he could be funny and he could be savage but ultimately he was so human and like i always love the fact that like he would be the first to admit if he was wrong about a band too most most writers don't want to do that shit now or probably then too nobody wants to be like you know what i fucked up the mc5 are great but he did and that's like that was one of the many things where i'm like this is this is my dude right here this is my hero um 
you know, and I think with any writing, like just be yourself. I mean, you're, I mean, you know, we're both writers. So I think we both connect on that level. It's just like, you know, don't, don't play the reader for a chump. And it's the same thing with listening. Like don't play your listeners for a chump. It's like, you know, you, you guys, you know, if you're not hungry, then don't fucking do it. It doesn't and that's mean what, you that's have That's what I think what Kiss does. Yeah. And there's no other way to put it. I never thought of it that way, but yeah, don't don't play your listeners for a chump. Yeah. And, and with any format, like directors, painters, whatever, like if if your heart's not into it, then go be an investment banker. Go go yeah. into realty. You know, don't don't foul up the arts any more than it's already been just, you know, snail trailed. And the all and the investment bankers gobble up all the tickets and go to the shows and and then shout Godzilla. You know, and shit. <laughs> you know what I mean. And then we can give them the. That's side another. Eye. That's another show. That's another episode. <laughs> yeah. But, you know. but no, there's this. I mean, I can't get past like like when he would. I remember he he wasn't a big fan of Pete Townsend. Always saying, "Oh, you know, uh, we're gonna pass the torch off to the younger kids. You know, give it to the jam. It's their turn. You know." And like like Townsend mm-hmm. was like, you know, when and and I remember Townsend like, "Rock is dead. Rock is dead. You know, it's just it's over. Fuck this. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm 37. Yeah, man, you're 37. Like now you're fucking 77 or however the fuck old you are. You know, yeah. it's it's like nobody saw it. Like nobody saw this coming. Nobody saw the next 50 years happening. Like, okay, you're going to retire at 37, okay, because you're embarrassed to be playing rock and roll at 37. God forbid. I mean, look, granted, there was no precedence for this, right? Yeah. Rock and roll was an experiment, right, for, for the young, by the young. You know, that all those cliche, things that have become cliches. Jagger didn't want to be singing Satisfaction past the age of 40. Bob mm. supposedly said never trust anybody over 30, you know, Bruce wasn't going to be singing Born to Run after 40, you know, all that stuff. There was like almost an embarrassment, you know, like if you look at like Elvis Presley's comeback show in 68, he's up there, he's breathing heavy, he's acting old, he's embarrassed to be up there. You know what I mean? It's almost like the guy was 33 years old. Yeah. 34. It's like, he, but there was no precedence. There was no like, there, there was like people people got older in their minds a lot quicker back then, I think. Oh, no? God, a- absolutely. No, and that's. And so, I mean, I always say the stones are now the template for what's possible because mm-hmm. there's nobody else doing it that long. You know, Paul McCartney's still out there, but these guys are either 80 or they're pushing 80. When Lester said that, you know, to let the stones could just should just keep doing it past their sixties until they drop dead. If he only knew, yeah. <laughs> you know, if he was here, if he could just like I think of him peeking in, you know, I peeking into the twenty first century. Yeah, you know, like if you know, if you could just like bring him back for a day, you know. Um, I mean, he called it when he was just like, you know, the counterculture, you know, the stones are not the model for any revolution, man, that the counterculture was just going to get absorbed into American capitalism. And it did, you know, Woodstock now Woodstock became a brand. It became a reason to sell Pepsi, you know, Woodstock 94 and Woodstock 99, you know, the peace Mm -hmm. symbol and like the whole nostalgia thing that happened for the Um, sixties, the cycles of nostalgia. Again, he, he, I don't want to say he prophesized it. He was just being observant, I think. The lack of new ideas, which I think is, you know, he was always, you know, the the bands like that he loved, like the the Velvet Underground, mm-hmm. or Patti Smith, or the Talking Heads, or anything like, you know, he was like, well, like none of these bands are about anything. You know, there was some sort of a theme, you know, their 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 reason for existence, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh uh, I I don't I don't see that happening now. No ideas. They're the, the examples of a few popular acts is kind of like testimony to like everything new is old. You know? Yeah, it's like um, and that definitely applies today. You know, well, well, listen to this band. I don't know. I don't know how many people come up to you and say, listen to this, listen to this, listen to this. Well, what's good about it? Well, it sounds like this. It sounds like Led Zeppelin. It sounds old. It sounds like this reminds me of this. This yeah. reminds me of that. 
So I think Lester even then was seeing like a lack of originality. Yeah. You know, he was like he's seeing a lack of vision. I think people must know I'm cranky or something because I don't have too many people <laughs> that are like listen to this. They're like, What's oh, Heather Drain? Gonna, Heather Drain's going to shoot this down. And I'm, I'm sitting there with my arms crossed going, I don't like it. But no, um, no, I think I will say this. I think it's easy. And I think I like to think at least it's hard. I mean, nobody obviously can say uh, what would happen. Uh, I mean, obviously, I, I think we all still wish Lester was here. I mean, even even if he wasn't writing music, like he was just a great writer, period. Like if he went if he went off and did the great American novel, it would have been phenomenal. But um, but there's always there's always something good going on music wise and it could be from a band like loyster cult doing a new album it could be from a band uh that's brand new you know it, it, and the thing is like the biggest thing that's changed is access because yeah payola like you and you mentioned it and it's perfect clear channel is like payola and well i was quoting you Oh, was it? Oh my God! <laughs> oh, how egotistical of me! But no, over but I, here. Like, me... I, again, there was a as I was I saying, <laughs> there was a reason I pulled that quote because I connected with it. You know, it, this is this is how I feel, man. And you know, yeah. Oh, thank. <laughs> thank that was you. Cool you and when I said that. Oh my gosh! Well, thank, thank you. Um, but it's a, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Mainstream venues are a joke. Radio is a complete and utter joke. Um, but. You have to work harder. I mean, it's it's weird because like with the internet, we have more access than ever in a ways or than we've ever had. But at the same time, because so much data, you really do kind of have to like, you know, hunt and peck a little bit for it. But there is always great stuff out there. I always try to encourage people like don't don't ever become like what you're like the previous generation is to you because i've heard yeah. people like in our age group i've heard people in their 30s like say are already bitching about oh the younger gen and it's like what you what are you talking are you talking about the fetuses like what the what do you mean the younger generation but also like we're all too young to already be parroting this archaic line that we're it's like to me it's offensive it's like you're telling people younger than you to give up and that's, I don't think that's ever, giving up is never an excuse. Like, and there's there's always great art. And sometimes it can be old art, but it's new to you. And sometimes it's gonna be some band you find on Bandcamp, you know, that is brand new, super independent, but you hear them and you're like, fuck, I love this. This yeah, is like, I, this I is, would, you know. I would love more than anything to like be that, like nothing grabs me anymore, you know? I'm not anti new music. No, but I play course. devil's at I'm, I play devil's advocate on this on this podcast a lot. Mm -hmm. um, one of the underlying I don't want to say it's become a joke, but you know, like the whole rock is dead. They've been saying rock is dead since 1959. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I so I've always taken that line, and um, okay, rock's dead. Let's see why it's dead. You know where where are who are the rock stars of the last 20 years? What are the big rock albums of the last 20 years? Do they stand up with the stuff in the seventies and eighties and the sixties and all that stuff? Um, when I think that like the only, and correct me if I'm wrong, I always challenge people when I think that they're the only guitar riff, the only famous guitar riff of the last 25 years is seven nation army. Mm -hmm. you know <laughs> like, like one guitar riff to come out of the entire 21st century so far because it's so universal everybody yeah. knows it nobody knows jack not everybody knows jack white but they know that sound they know that riff yeah they may not know it's a rock song but they know what it is you know um there was a time when you can have dozens of these riffs come out of any single given year of of between 1965 and 19 I don't know, 90 something. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So I, I, I've played devil's advocate. Doesn't mean I agree with it. You know what I mean? But it's like, um, where am I going with this? <laughs> so I'm always like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, all right. So old is good because like in a sense that like I would love to be that grabbed by something new. And I'm always mm -hmm. saying like, 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 and the younger people, I'll be like, okay, Tell me what's hot. Tell me what's good. You know, turn me on to this. Like, what are you listening to? You know? Yeah. Let me hear it. And I listen to a lot of new stuff. 
But like the stuff that I really love, like I, I'm in the cleanup phase right now. Like I'm in the cleanup years where I go in, like I discover a lot of old stuff that I maybe didn't listen to. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't, you know, like the first 50 years of my life didn't hear. It took me like, um, all right. So like some people love Steely Dan, some people hate them. I love them, but I didn't really discover them till like my late thirties. That's just an example. It's like, okay, yeah. never listen to Steely Dan. Let me hear him. It took me like fucking 30 years to listen to ACDC, like really mm-hmm. listen to ACDC. You know what I mean? So, all right. Um, I always hated yes. All right. As I, oh, I, man. I was like, all right, let me listen to fragile. Let me like really give it a chance, you know? So it's like, all right, what did I miss now? I'm yeah. going back. Okay. What did I miss? So I don't know. It's all, but, all but that's, new, but that's new. That's new to you in a way. Like I feel, I feel like that stuff can count too, especially cause I mean, I love finding those discoveries. Like we're even like when it's certainly bands you're familiar with or you're, you know, like, Oh yeah, I know of this band, but then all of a sudden you have like that bright blue spark. And it's like, like Hawkwind was like that for me. Cause like I had known of Hawkwind for years and then like, there was one night, um, gosh, quite a few years ago now, where one night my husband and I were like, you know, oh, let's just, I just, we won't watch music documentary and the BBC do really good documentaries. Oh, they get one on Hawkwind. We'll watch that. And that, for some reason, like opened up a portal. And like, now I'm like huge Hawkwind fan, like Robert Calvert. Isn't that uh, great though? Like when you I like get, discover something, like where was this stuff my whole life? You know? I know. But there's know. a reason, like I waited you know, and now there's something to get excited about again. You know, that's what I love. But unfortunately, it's all old music for me. You yeah. know, like I did a show with um, a writer from Texas and she's 25 a couple of weeks ago. It's like my latest episode. And and she's like very excited about like Greta Van Fleet. And mm-hmm. this, like a, there's a fictional band out, some show Daisy something um, that's based on Fleetwood Mac and uh, oh yeah, yeah she no. loves she loves new music and she's like totally excited about it and i'm like i wish i could feel that again for new music you know and i'm oh and i'm open to it i'm not this mm-hmm. naysayer i'm not like oh you know my generation's superior to everything else you know like let me hear it you know i'm always my ears are always open but it's always the old stuff you know like once a year i i discover like some like at least three or four great things that i love like alice coltrane last year alice oh. coltrane was my most played artist of 2022 oh hell so, yeah you mentioned Pharaoh that. sanders i think she did with Pharaoh sanders in like in like 1970 um uh there's always good stuff out there there's so much good stuff yeah. oh well no that's the and i i love that i mean i think i think it's important with um with discovering stuff that's actually like chronologically new it's like anything else it's kind of like love it has to be a little on the organic side like you have yeah. to i mean i try to seek new stuff out too but i also just kind of let it um filter in but i'm also kind of like you're at least more open to talking to other people and be like recommend stuff because i'm like so like like a, a lot like not a lone wolf <laughs> that sounds terrible but i'm just like where where is my you know where's my tuning fork taking me um but uh there there obviously there are people but it's like the, the handful of people i would actually be like hey what are you listening to that i would actually do that are probably pretty small just because most people i talk to on a day-to-day basis like locally most of them just listen to kind of like regular stuff and art like aren't really like music driven you know it's more just like whatever's popular or you know it's just not my scene it wasn't my scene when I was you know when I was a kid it's not now I mean you know so I I don't know but no, I, I think the people you're talking about I yeah you, you want to hear music snobbery at its finest listen to my episode called 10 songs we can't stand or something like that it was like, oh, like four yes. years ago man I talk about those people. Oh my God. No, I, I, so you get it. And it's um like the one I really can't deal with is when people and somebody actually, <laughs> I heard that somebody said this recently, like at my day job where they asked her, oh, like, what are some of your favorite bands to listen to? And she's like, oh, I don't really like, she's like, there's music I listen to, but I just listen to what's on the radio and don't really pay yeah, attention yeah, to I it. Yeah. I love those people, man. <laughs> oh, oh my God. I'm like, I, there's... What, what was your favorite song? I don't know. I like that. You like the stuff. I love the Rolling Stones. Oh, what's your favorite song? Oh, I don't know. What's that song they have? You can start me up. 
that really, you know, and, and, <laughs> you can start. So, oh, so, God. Yeah. I can't, I can't, I, I, to me, it's just like, wow. Like you have it. it uh, I don't, and I don't mean to be a snob, but I'm just like, it's like the a human that, equivalent that's to the like, only way I can put it though. Like we're oh, snobs. It's, we're, it's no. okay, we're snobs. We're, I, I prefer <laughs> to think of it as passionate. No. We are passionate people. Yes. Cause people like, it's just weird to me when people don't have any passion. snobs. Like that's a great I mean, name. That's a band name. Passionate snobs. Yes, or a oh, zine. There was no. Is there a band called Passionate Snobs? No, but there should be. That's my knowledge, at least. There might be. I'll say that now. We'll find Passionate one. Passionate <laughs> Snobs. Oh my god, I love that. Yeah. No, but there's <laughs> there's like we were going through we we're going through our uh, you know and I'll wrap this up in a few minutes because I know we're like really pushing. Uh, holy shit! It's like. Yeah, we 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 have been shitty chatting, my yeah. friend. Yeah, <laughs> um, I'm gonna I'm gonna edit some of this because there were there was this like left turns that I took that just where I was just like talking shit. But um, uh, where was I going with? Yeah, so like songs I can't stand, you know. And there's mm. like you know like one of them is Moni Moni, yeah. <laughs> and I was just like, why is it that every lame non music fan loves Moni Moni? You know, and it's just like if you hey, if you like it, great. Maybe you like it. I don't. I mean, it's not that I don't. I don't like it. It's just I'm boring. A, it's I'm just indifferent. Like connect the dots, <laughs> like. And I was just like, yeah, this is music for people who don't like music. Yeah. You know? And it's just like, but there's like there's like these hand handful of songs that I put into that group that people that aren't really huge music fans love it, and Moni Moni's always one of them. Oh, Africa like, by Toto. Africa is another one. Wild thing um oh god yeah um, no i if i never hear wild thing again yeah. it's uh, i'm fine unless it's like the, the sam kinnison one is funny so anyway rock under fire you've been listening to the dorico drain comedy hour the afternoon drive time show dorico you know, drain huh the alliteration was great <laughs> all the yes we, we totally no. are like the, the shock jocks from hell over here I have the always enchanting Heather Drain Rock Under Fire podcast. Is there any place uh, where can listeners go to to find out about you or anything you're working on or any future projects? Is, you know, is there anything? Is is it Mondo Heather? We have to plug this. We yes, have to plug Mondo Heather. I thank you. I I um. I absolutely shamelessly encourage you on this endeavor. Yes, you can go to my website, mondoheather.com. Um, I'm also on Twitter and Instagram under at Mondo Heather. And I even have a Patreon, which I know this is going to shock and amaze everybody, but it's under at Mondo Heather. Um, so any of those venues work uh, as far as keeping up with my uh, projects, article work, podcast appearances, um, random musings um occasionally i'll probably gush about my dog and because i've become that person and uh and yeah so please please check me out if the spirit moves you excellent excellent <laughs> thanks again this was this was awesome oh no thank you this, my pleasure this was awesome <laughs>